Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to the first of a four-part series, Ramadan Halakha, Islamic Theology 101 with Dr. Fariel Salem. Um, my name is Shadia Igram. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Muslim space, we are a uh, Islamic community organization primarily based in Austin, Texas. However, due to the pandemic, we have created sort of a hybrid model where much of our content um, also exists online. Uh, which allows for us to um, invite fantastic speakers like Dr. Salem, who doesn't have to leave her home in Chicago, allows me to participate while I'm sitting in Iowa, and of course, connecting to our Austin based community. I'd like to just briefly um, introduce Dr. Salem. Uh, her resume, mashallah, is quite incredible, but I'm going to just briefly. Um, briefly give you a little bio. And then honestly, I'm gonna hand it over to her because I know she has a fantastic presentation. Uh, following her presentation, we will open it up for Q&A. If you would like, you can um, message me your questions and I will moderate them towards the end of the, um, of the session, or you are more than welcome to hold on to them. Raise your hand during the Q&A portion and I will ask you to unmute and ask your question. So Dr. Fariel Salem is an Associate Professor of Arabic and Islamic Studies, as well as Director of the Master of Divinity in Islamic Studies and Muslim Chaplaincy Programs at the American Islamic College. Her research interests include Islamic philosophy and theology in the post-classical period, interfaith dialogue, and the development of Muslim thought in the contemporary era as it came into conversation with aspects of modernity. Dr. Salem is the author of The Emergence of Early Sufi Piety and Sunni Scholasticism, uh, Abdullah bin al-Mubarak and the found Formation of Sunni Identity in the Second Islamic Century, printed 2016. If that's not a mouthful, I don't know what is. Um, she's also recently named one of 25 Influential American Muslims by CNN. I'm actually going to put this link in the chat box. You'll have to go check it out because she is in fantastic company, or rather, they are in fantastic company with her. Um, and she was uh, awarded this recognition for her work in higher education. Dr. Salem serves on a number of professional boards across the country and regularly travels internationally to engage in scholarship on Islam with academics from a range of diverse institutions. Dr. Salem was also previously taught at Hartford Seminary, where she was Assistant Professor of Islamic Scriptures and co-director of its Islamic Chaplaincy Program. She received her PhD in Islamic Studies from the University of Chicago's Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. Now, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Fariel Salem. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you very much for that um, introduction, Shadia. Um, it's wonderful to be with all of you today, Ramadan Mubarak, and um, thank you for all being here. I'm looking forward to this series uh, on Islamic Theology 101. Uh, before I share my slides, I just want to start with a dua. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. Allahumma allimna bima yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima allamtana wa zidna ilma wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa habibana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Um, so I'm going to share my slides. Let's do, let's try this one. Okay. All right, can everyone see these? Yes, okay. All right, so our first session will look at the history and the development of Islamic theology. How did Islamic theology develop as a field? What were the questions that uh, people asked? Um, how did this all come together? So before we can even think about Islamic theology, we need to think about what is in a word to begin with. What does the word theology mean? The word theology is made up of two words coming from Greek, theos and logia. Uh, theos means God and logia means discourse or reason. Um, and it, in summary, it means discourse or reasoning uh, regarding God. 
Uh, it's important to also consider the um, relationship that languages have with different religious traditions. So um, Greek, a lot of uh, Christian theology was written in the Greek language. And so many frameworks and terms used within uh, uh, terms derived from Greek, even if they are in English right now, have a affinity with Christian theology. But Muslims also had their own theology. They very much did, um, but they used their own terminology. And so I think it's important to study also the Arabic and how Muslims used uh, discourse about God in their own framework using their uh, specific or their special relationship with the Arabic language as being the language in which the Quran is believed to have been revealed by Muslims. So um, if we look at the hadith of Gabriel, we see that within this hadith, this is a well-known hadith that uh, Muslims recite or uh, narrate. And this is the hadith uh, that the angel Gabriel came to the prophet one day when he was sitting with his companions. And he asked him, and he came in the form of a man. He was dressed in white in the desert, where if somebody is, is either they're known to the community or they're coming as a traveler, which would then mean that they're dirty and dusty from travel. But um, the hadith goes, uh, a man came upon the prophet and the companions, uh, and he was dressed in white clothing with no trace of uh, traveling on him, meaning he was all clean. He came to the prophet, put his hands on his thighs and asked the prophet Muhammad, what is Islam, what is Iman, and what is Ihsan? Now I'm summarizing this uh, much longer hadith, but um, the Prophet Muhammad answers the question, what is Islam, by saying it is the five pillars of um, Islam, to believe in God, to uh, pray the, uh, the, uh, the ritual prayers, to fast Ramadan, to give zakat, and to perform hajj. And the angel Gabriel, the man says, um, you're right, correct. And everybody is surprised saying, how come he's asking the question to the prophet and then uh, correcting him saying that he's right. Um, then he asks, what is Iman? And the prophet Muhammad gives the six pillars of faith, which I will go into here. Uh, it's belief in God, the angels, the books, the messengers, uh, the day of judgment and God's determinism of events, Qada and Qadr. And so uh, the angel Gabriel says, you're right. And then he asks him, and what is Ihsan? And the prophet Muhammad answers saying, it is, to, uh, it is to worship God as though you see him. And if you don't see him, you are always aware. You are aware that he sees you. And so um, look from this hadith, the way Muslims have envisioned their own tradition over the centuries is that um, Islam has three dimensions. It has a dimension that is uh, oriented towards action, and there's a whole field that develops in um, studying what does it mean to act properly within, um, as a Muslim, uh, what, does it, what is it that God wants Muslims to do? And this became known as the field of fiqh. The second dimension of iman is the dimension of belief, which became known as uh, what we would translate into English as theology and had many um, versions in the Arabic language, which I will go over briefly. But there are different words used to study what is it that Muslims need to believe in to be, um, to be following a proper creed. And then the third dimension is this dimension of Ihsan, in which uh, Muslims did not just believe that you have to do good things and believe certain things to be a good Muslim, but that you also had to be good from within. And um, this then is where the field of Islamic spirituality, Sufism, Tazkiya, Akhlaq, uh, ethics, etc., develops. So in this particular um, series of talks, I'm going to be focusing on the second dimension here. This is the dimension of Iman or theology. So uh, looking at this again a bit more closely, the six pillars of Iman in this hadith uh, is belief in God, angels, books, messengers, the day of judgment, and God's determinism of events. 
So as Muslims start to think about Islamic theology, they also then divide Islamic theological um, chapters, sections into this um, three, uh, three parts. So the first part is ilahiyat, and this involves discourses about God himself, his essential nature, his that, and his attributes, the sifat. The second uh, section of Islamic theology uh, talks about nubuwat. So you'll see an entire section in um, theology texts that talk about prophecy revelation, uh, what is the difference between a prophet and a messenger, miracles versus karamat, what is the evidence of this and the other, et cetera, et cetera. And what is revelation? What is the difference between, say, ilham, which might be inspiration from the divine, from God, from God's angels, as opposed to uh, revelation, which uh, the prophets are believed to receive uh, divine words from God directly. And this is um, called wahi. So these are topics that you'll find discussed in the section of Nubuwat. And then finally, you'll see the section Mabda wal Ma'ad, which again, um, focuses on topics of creation and eschatology. Eschatology means the day of judgment and things that will happen at the end of times. So we see based on this foundational set of pillars of Iman, uh, Islamic theology becomes divided into these three broad sections. Uh, what are some of the terms that Muslims uh, use to describe theology in Arabic? So you'll see that the different terms that Muslims use also reflects the different orientation through which those who are speaking about God come from. So one term that's used is aqida or haqaid, which we might translate as creed or beliefs. And these constitute, these are texts that constitute basic foundational beliefs that are held to held within a broad category of those who adhere to the Muslim faith. So these are things that everybody is expect to, expected to believe in. Um, it focuses only on God's attributes, God's actions, and eschatology without develop uh, without develop without delving into philosophical arguments, as we'll see in other approaches to Islamic theology. So Aqidah is pretty straightforward. Um, it, it will go into belief in God and what Muslims are supposed to believe about God and the day of judgment and these types of things. Usul al-Din is similar to Aqidah as a field and the term Aslan, it means foundation. So Usul, the foundations of Deen, which is religion, is um, termed this way because proper belief is uh, regarded as being foundational to the proper faith. So another word that's used is usul al-din. So if you go to Al-Azhar, for example, in Cairo, the faculty or the department of usul al-din is actually the department of theology. Another term that's used is fiqh al-akbar. And um, contrary to what one might be inclined to think, fiqh al-akbar is actually not about what we term fiqh as in um, proper outward practice. The word fiqh itself means simply understanding, um, proper um, wisdom, interpretation, things like this. And so Imam Abu Hanifa considered belief in God and understanding God to be the greatest of understanding. So his work on theology is uh, titled Fiqh al-Akbar for this reason. Imam Abu Hanifa was also based in Kufa, which is uh, close to Baghdad in Iraq. And he led the school of Ra'i, which emphasized the use of reason. So this was, uh, you find, uh, in the first Islamic century, in the second Islamic century, there is a, a division that begins to occur between those who interpreted words of the prophet from a more literal uh, approach and those who um, used interpretation and looked for the spirit of what the prophet Muhammad might have said in a hadith and tried to apply it into new contexts that may take different outward forms. So Imam Abu Hanifa led the school of Ra'i, which was the school of reason. 
Um, Fiqh al-Akbar is the earliest work on Islamic theology that uses the method of reason to talk about God. And we're going to see later on when we talk about different schools of theology that the Maturidi school of theology comes out of this tradition of the Fiqh al-Akbar. Finally, another uh, term that Muslims use for theology is ilm al-Tawheed wa sifat And um, this is not always, but often is the method used by the Ahlul Hadith, people of Hadith, that rely solely on scripture as a, a primary source of theology. So they will not use um, a lot of reason and rational arguments in proving um, to their readers that God exists and how do we know that God exists and things like this. They will not um, delve into those issues. Um, books on ilm al-tawheed wa sifat discuss matters related to God and God's attributes. Uh, they also discuss uh, revelation and eschatology, but these were added later in time. Um, and even when these sections were added later, the section on ilahiyat, which is um, uh, discussions about God, is always the most detailed section. And I think this is pretty much the case throughout um, Islamic theological texts. Is the section on Islamic um, beliefs about God is going to be the longest. And then the section on Nubuwat or the section on uh, the section on prophecy and eschatology, Mabda wal Ma'ad, these are things that are a lot shorter in comparison. Um, finally, we have another term for Islamic theology and this is Kalam. And we might uh, say this is philosophical theology. Some people might use the word theosophy. And Kalam evolves over the first few centuries of Islam, and it starts out as controversial, but then it becomes mainstream for Muslim thinkers to use the methodology of Kalam to talk about God. Uh, in distinction to philosophy, Kalam anchors revelation as a source of knowledge and then uses the tools of reasoning and, and the questions that come up with uh, rational thought and philosophies at times um, uh, to discuss these questions and to debate from, uh, from a perspective that's grounded in revelation. Um, so for instance, for the mutakallimin, those who are specialists in kalam, the existence of God, one God, his oneness, God's existence, the prophet Muhammad and his prophecy, the day of judgment, etc., are accepted as foundational truths in the methodology of kalam. Um, in the beginning, uh, kalam is a methodology, and then over time it turns into a field itself. So kalam, uh, when it first starts out, is a way of talking about God, um, with people who have different beliefs about God. So it's really uh, important also uh, to understand the audiences that these different approaches to Islamic theology are engaging. So if you live in a homogenous community and everybody is Muslim and there isn't any, there aren't different ideas going around about God and um, uh, leadership and all of these issues that we're going to talk about in a minute, then you might just do ilm al-tawheed wa sifat, or you might just focus on aqidah or usul al-deen. This is more common. But um, in places like Iraq, for example, like Khurasan, like Central Asia, where you, there's a lot of diversity and diverse um, belief systems around one, as well as intra-faith diversity, being able to engage in kalam, being able to talk about God rationally and with reason becomes essential. It becomes an essential way of um, uh, preserving faith for those who practice this methodology of theology. So let's look at uh, kalam a little bit more closely. Um, you, we find that there are three categories of knowledge in ancient philosophy and of Kalam. So Kalam looks at three questions. 
The first section of Kalam text will talk about ontology. And ontology means the question of existence, wujud. What does it mean for God to exist? How do we know that God exists? What does it mean for physical objects and living beings to exist? How is this related to God's existence? Is there a problem in that there is a partnership or shirk between God's existence and the existence of objects or the universe? If you were gonna say that the universe exists eternally and that existence is parallel to God's existence, are we then not saying that God shares an attribute with a created thing, which then um, becomes a form of, um, could become a form of um, corrupted monotheism or polytheism? So these are questions that are asked and examined. Um, for an environment that is diverse, where the, and this is where Kalam is, is um, a stronghold, many people want to be able to understand or believe in God using re rational arguments. Um, if, uh, if these theologians in the second century from their perspective are going to use Quran and Hadith to talk to people who don't believe in the Quran as the revealed word of God, or they don't accept Hadith, then they're not going to be able to get anywhere in these conversations. So Kalam uses reason as a neutral methodology that everybody can accept regardless of what their theological uh, positions are personally, and that these then open um, doors for interaction, dialogue, conversation among those of different beliefs. Uh, the second question you'll find, or the second topic that you will find in Kalam texts is epistemology. And epistemology asks the question, how do we know things? How do we know God? How do we know the world exists? How do we know what existence actually is? So how we know what we know is the field of epistemology. And third, uh, these texts also think about methodology. How do we acquire knowledge? Is it through naql or haql? If not, Naql is scripture, haql is reason. Does scripture take precedence to reason? Does reason take precedence to scripture? What if you see, what if there's something in scripture that appears to contradict logic or reason? How does one deal with, it, with these questions? So this is uh, methodology. Okay, so now that we have a basic definition of theology, what books of theology, how they're structured, Let's look at how theological discussions formed. What were the factors which led to the foundations of Islamic theology? The first and perhaps the most important factor that led to the establishment of Islamic theology is Islam's early history. So the first question that Muslims ask among themselves is, who will lead the Muslim community after the death of the Prophet Muhammad? Um, there was a short period of debate among uh, the companions, including the Ansar, who wanted to lead after the Prophet died in the Muhajirun. Um, and uh, this was settled by uh, early on. And the companions uh, elected Abu Bakr to lead after the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, but the, there was a problem in that uh, Sayyidina Ali, the fourth caliph, Ali, the son-in-law of the prophet, was not present when these discussions were happening because he was um, uh, washing the body of the prophet and preparing it for burial. So there were some objections early on in the Islamic history, but later uh, Ali himself gives bay'ah to Abu Bakr. Um, Abu Bakr was considered by Muslims to be the most qualified person for uh, continuing the legacy of the Prophet Muhammad because he was his closest companion. His wife Aisha became a scholar of the Muslim community. She was, uh, she had the greatest number of hadiths. She was a teacher. And um, uh, the Prophet Muhammad had appointed Abu Bakr to lead after, uh, after to lead the prayer after he died. But interestingly, the Prophet did not make any explicit statements about 
how political leadership or religious leadership should proceed. And uh, those who argue for Abu Bakr's leadership will say the reason for this is that the Prophet Muhammad did not want to limit the Muslim community with one particular mold. So um, different forms of leadership work in different times of history in different geographic regions. And so uh, in some places that might be a monarchy, in some places that might be a democratic election, in some periods of time it might be a dynasty, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, this is not, if it were something that was truly a theological issue um, for, uh, from the Sunni perspective, then this would have been uh, laid out clearly. And its absence of clear uh, being laid out clearly actually creates a lot of ease for the Muslim community. So that was the perspective of those who, um, um, who continued to support uh, Shura and Bay'ah and other methods of uh, leadership of the Muslim community. Um, another early incident that happened uh, is the assassination of Osman. Now, this turns into a theological problem because when Ali becomes caliph after Osman, um, he decides not to punish the perpetrators because the assassination of Osman was such a, it was so messy and there were so many different groups involved in this that Ali's perspective was that if he went after the perpetrators and punished them, that this would create greater bloodshed in the Muslim community, this would create a greater rupture among Muslims. Whereas there were those who felt that, that um, not punishing the perpetrators or, and not holding the assassins of Uthman accountable uh, was unjust. And uh, those who held that position were led by uh, under the leadership of Aisha, who uh, led an army uh, on a camel. You see this miniature here. This is an illustration of the incident in which Aisha and a number of uh, the companions led an army against uh, Ali and a number of his companions, um, demanding that Ali hold accountable the assassins of Arthman. Now, um, there's a skirmish that occurs and a number of uh, Sahaba die in this battle, but it also is quickly put to an end um, and uh, they separate. But, um, and interestingly, the Sunni position on this particular incident is not that one side is entirely right, one side is entirely wrong, but that both sides had a valid claim here, but that Hali's claim was a stronger claim than Haisha's claim. And that doesn't mean that Haisha was a bad person. It doesn't mean that um, those who uh, participated um, in the battle and uh, stood against Ali's troops were um, bad Muslims. None of the, these are claims made by um, Sunni Muslims. Uh, the second incident that we see in early Islamic history is the Battle of Safin. And uh, this is where Muawiyah then uh, sends soldiers against Ali's soldiers because Muawiyah does not accept the caliphate of Ali. Now, if you recall, Muawiyah is also related to Uthman and uh, the Uthmanids were Umayyads. They, were, they had a business and trade based in Syria. And these ha had historical roots with the Arab tribes in that region, uh, the Ghassanids, as opposed to the Lahmids, who were aligned with the Sasanians, the Ghassanids were aligned with the Byzantines. So um, Ali makes his capital Kufa in Iraq, and he shifts where these economic uh, trade centers are. So there's also that element of tension there for Muawiyah. Muawiyah um, rejects the leadership of Ali and he sends troops to, um, to face Ali's uh, soldiers. And at the end, uh, Ali uh, agrees to an arbitration. 
And, um, and this was another way in uh, Imam Ali, Sayyidina Ali's perspective of um, minimizing bloodshed among Muslims, minimizing conflict among Muslims. He chose to arbitrate, let's make a deal with Muawiyah so that he accepts uh, uh, leadership of Ali and um, things are settled. So after this uh, arbitration, there were those who broke off from this group and said, no one can arbitrate except God. And these were the Khawarij. Uh, these were those who uh, took things uh, literally and they believed that Uthman and Ali and Muawiyah, all of these people were wrong because rather than fighting it out and seeing who God allows to win and lose, they decided to, um, uh, to make a deal with one another rather than letting God choose the sides by seeing who will win in the battle. So this um, was a literalist, hard, harsh interpretation that ended up doing takfir of a lot of companions and good Muslims. So these were all the issues of early Islamic history that um, created theological questions. So the questions that arose, why is this important? Why was this whole earliest historical background that I gave you all relevant or related to theology? It's related to theology because uh, there are all these questions that appear based on these early incidents. The first question, of course, is what is the nature of Islamic leadership or what is the nature of uh, the one leading the Muslim community. Is it now secular? That's probably not the best word. That's a modern term. But um, for Sunnis, political and religious leadership are separate. The person who is leading politically does not have to be also the most pious person in the Muslim community. So, uh, but for Shias, religious and political leadership are one. And the person who is the leader of the Muslim community is also supposed to be the one who is most pious among them. Uh, we're going to talk about this actually in detail, I think, in our third session. But, um, but for lack of a better term, uh, the questions that arose from these incidents, remember, the first is what is the nature of leadership for Muslims in Islam? Is it secular or is it theocratic? Um, second question, what is the relationship between faith and action? We see that some of the companions fought and killed one another in battle. What is their status? Did they leave Islam? Are they no longer Muslim? Are they going to hell? Are we supposed to, are Muslims supposed to condemn them? So what does it mean? Uh, are faith and action one or are they separate? Another question related to this is, do major sins take one out of the faith? Are actions separate from faith? We see this once again. So if a Muslim killed another Muslim in the battlefield, the, uh, murder or killing is a major sin if one considers one side to be entirely wrong and the other side to be entirely right. Uh, murder or killing is a sin. And so does that take one out of the faith? Did the participants in these battles then sin out of their own free will, or did God determine what they will do? So did God will that this person is going to fight this person in the battlefield? If God willed that in advance, then how is God a just God if he's going to then hold people accountable for things that God already determined in advance? Um, do people, or did people choose to do these actions freely? If they did, then is, does this mean that human will parallels God's will? Does that then limit God's omnipotence? So these are questions that uh, arise. So God's determination versus free will and theodicy. Theodicy is the question of why does God allow bad things to happen? And actually, these are different. Uh, we're going to talk about each of these um, topics in our in the next sessions, three through uh, two through four, inshallah.
Other factors which led to the foundation of Islamic theology is interaction with other traditions. So as Islam expands geographically, it, in, it interacts with uh, Iran, Persia, India, Assyrians in Iraq, Christians and Jews and other faiths in these various regions. Um, new questions arise as interfaith interaction and polemi polemics become common. Uh, also, in addition to um, debates that happen with those of other traditions, there are also many converts that convert to Islam from other traditions and uh, bring with them the civilizational, the civilizations and frameworks of engagement with theological questions uh, that they then start to engage as Muslims. So what did we say here? They, it created a new Muslim culture that incorporated new customs within the framework of an Islamic religious model based on Tawheed and articles of faith and practice. Other factors which led to the formation of Islamic theology. So these are all, we're talking about all the different questions that uh, Muslims started to address and uh, respond to that they formed into a, into a whole field called theology. So another factor which led to the formation of Islamic theology is its interaction with philosophy. Um, we see that uh, Aristotle and ancient philosophy, Socrates, Plato, uh, por um, um, not Porphyry, Plotinus, uh, these were texts, these were works that were read all the way from um, not just in modern day Greece, but east of this geographic region. And this was something that was indigenous to these lands. So in centers in, of Syria and um, modern day Anatolia, modern day Turkey, Alexandria, Iraq, uh, parts of Central Asia, parts of Iran, people were reading ancient philosophical texts. In fact, ancient philosophy didn't come to Europe until much later when um, Europeans started interacting with um, Arab uh, thinkers, and then they translated Arabic uh, philosophical works into uh, Latin. But um, when uh, philosophy was uh, flowering and burgeoning in these regions east of Greece, all the way from uh, modern day Turkey through Central Asia, Iran, even parts of India, it went pretty far east. The individuals of these regions didn't just read the texts and not interact with them. They read these texts and then they added to them and restructured them and redeveloped philosophy into a whole new field that um, changed the, uh, uh, that developed ancient philosophy itself and uh, gave it an Islamic lens. So initially those who wrote on, uh, uh, ancient philosophy were Arab Christians, uh, that then uh, these writings and these discussions were taken on by Muslims. And we find that some of the earliest Islamic philosophers were Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, Avicenna, and uh, they bring with them different questions that have theological implications. And so theologians address these questions. Uh, we see that the Muratazilites, uh, in their um, attempt to defend Islam, uh, to those who are attacking Islam based on rational uh, uh, premises and premises based in reason and philosophy, the Muratazilites uh, relied heavily on the methodology of philosophers. And um, we're going to look a little bit more into that. Another issue that um, led to the formation of Islamic theology is Quranic interpretation. So this idea of anthropomorphism. Uh, the Quran has various verses that describe God in human form. Yadullahi fawqa aidihim. God's hand is on their hand. 
uh, that God set upon his throne. It gives God a throne and it also gives God a direction. So how does one interpret these things if God is beyond uh, space, time, and he is not, he does not have a physical form. So these became another, um, the, this became another theological problem that theologians tried to solve. Um, can one use metaphor interpretation that we if um, it is impossible that God has a physical hand, can we interpret that as God's power? So these two, again, become uh, questions that Muslim theologians debate and discuss. Okay, so this section was all of this clear. So what we did, I'm just gonna summarize real quick. We talked about the foundations of Islamic theology. What were the questions that Muslim theologians were addressing and discussing? We said first it was issues that were raised by early Islamic history. We talked about the questions that arose as a result of early Islamic history, particularly things related to the role of faith in action, uh, major sins, do they take one out of faith? What is the nature of Islamic leadership? Uh, God's determination versus free will. So these were questions that were that came out of the early Islamic history. And of all of the various issues that arise, this is probably the most significant of them. And then we looked at how Islam interacted with other faith traditions and how that uh, uh, led to uh, different conversations and texts of theology. We looked at philosophy and we looked at uh, problematic verses or verses that appear problematic to the reader because it looks like they are um, uh, supporting anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism is giving human form to God. And so how does one interpret these verses? So these were all questions that then found its way into books of Kalam or Islamic theology. So we find that there are different theological schools that develop to address these questions we discussed. Uh, the first are the Mu'tazilites. Uh, the Mu'tazilites had five pillars of Mu'tazilite theology. And the first is monotheism. The second is justice. The third is the promise and the threat, al-wa'ad wal-wa'id. And this means the promise of heaven and the threat of punishment for those who do bad. Um, the intermediate position, al-manzila bain manzilatain. So they held that those who um, committed major sins, who were from the companions who had al manzila bain manzilatain, they neither would go to heaven nor hell, but that there is this place that's between these two places that um, everyone is, um, is there is stuck between two different positions. Uh, commanding the good and prohibiting the evil, Amr bil Ma'ruf wa Nahi an al Munkar. So these are the five pillars of Mu'tazilite theology. They also give precedence to reason over scripture. And um, for those who objected to the Mu'tazilites, they found this troubling because um, those who objected to the Mu'tazilites were concerned that once you give precedence to reason over scripture, then there's no control or there's no, um, you don't know where that reason will take one. It could be that one could reason their way out of um, fulfilling obligations or um, one does not have to adhere to um, God's commands and things like this. So they, there was a concern regarding this. The Mu'tazilites were initially Hanafis in Baghdad, predominantly. And um, the, this is as opposed to the Hanafis of, say, Samarqand and Bukhara, who were Maturidis, and they opposed Mu'tazilism. Over time, the Sunnis abandoned Mu'tazilism completely, and Mu'tazili ideology and theology and thoughts become um, taken into Shia theology. So it becomes incorporated into uh, Shia theology. 
um, Mu'tazilism and the development of kalam. So Mu'tazilite thinkers are credited with being among the first to use rational arguments and logic to respond to the theological questions previously mentioned. So all of these issues that I brought up, they responded using rational arguments. Um, this was significant in that it contributed to the conversion of Islam in newly conquered areas by communities in places like Iraq who could relate to the rational argument of the Martezilites. So if you are in this new area where uh, people around you are Zoroastrian or maybe they're atheists, you can't say, well, God says in the Quran, such and such. They're gonna tell you, I don't believe in the Quran and I don't believe that Muhammad is the messenger of God. So if you want to um, have an impact or persuade uh, these groups of people in outside of Mecca and Medina, the Mu'tazilites held that you have to be able to engage in rational arguments and rational debates about God. And um, this historically turned out to be, um, the Mu'tazilites turned out to be effective in their uh, capacity to convert people in new areas that uh, Islam expanded to. Um, Hanafis based in Kufa were another group to use reason in defense of theology. Kufan Islamic practice was based upon the school of Umar ibn al-Khattab. So um, the Hanafis, so the Hanafis, Imam Abu Hanifa himself led the school of Ra'i, of rational reasoning. He was not a Mu'tazilite, that would be anachronistic to use that term. Um, but the people who came after him some of them, some of them were more, some of them geared more towards Muratazilism, whereas others geared more towards a uh, reading of scripture that's, that gives precedence to scripture over reason. So there were those among the followers of Imam Abu Hanifa based in Baghdad and Kufa that uh, were well-known Mu'tazilites. And they did so with really good intention, saying that uh, you need to be able to use reason and you need to be able to rationally um, defend uh, one's faith in order to be effective. Now, I believe I say something more about this in the next slides. <clears throat> Uh, this is also a time that you have various uh, religious sects that emerge. So people who are Muslim, but have beliefs that uh, most Muslims consider heterodox. So the first sect is the Qadariya. So in their attempt to answer questions of free will and determinism, um, they attempt to do this by alleging that humans have a will that is independent and parallel to God's will. So these were the Qadariya. It's interesting that the word Qadar is used to label those who are really against Qadar, who are against God's determinism. Um, there's also a political context to this as well, because the Qadariya, many of whom emerged from Syria, were um, responding to the Umayyads, who uh, a lot of the Muslim community, a large portion of the Muslim community, objected to their forms of leadership a lot of the Muslim community saw the Umayyads as um, not emulating the model of the Prophet Muhammad in their practice and their piety and their beliefs. And many people were unhappy with the Umayyad leadership. But the Umayyads said that they were in charge because God determined that and that God willed it. So when the Qadariya come and say there is that people choose their actions freely and that there is nothing that's determined, there's also a political element there in which they're responding to Umayyad claims of divine authority or divine, uh, div divine authority to rule through God's will. Uh, then in response to the Qadariya, you have the Jabriya that emerge and they hold the opposite view. They say that humans have no separate will of their own and everything is determined by God. This then creates another problem in that if uh, God is uh, determining everything. How can God be a just God and determine that people are going to sin and then punish them for that sin? Uh, 
Uh, you also see that the Shi'at Ali emerge, who claim that the Prophet had designated Ali as his heir to rule, and this was usurped by Abu Bakr Omar Osman. And this is um, very much a back projection that comes about later in time, because um, uh, rationally, if Ali had been commanded to rule by the Prophet Muhammad, and he didn't fulfill that task, he would have been in disobedience to the Prophet if he didn't fight for it, if he didn't stand up for what the Prophet had commanded him to do. So, um, and we're gonna actually look at the Ghadir Khum incident and how that's interpreted by Shias and Sunnis in our third session. Um, but what we find in, uh, in this period is the emergence of what are known as Ghulat min al-Shia or excess, um, extreme people, extreme Shia position. So there was always a sympathy with the Ahlul Bayt that was shared among everybody. Um, it wasn't limited to what we later on would say are Shia versus Sunni. Uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi'i was from the Ahlul Bayt. So uh, the scholars and the Imams and the leaders that Sunnis consider Imams all had um, affinity towards the Ahlul Bayt and they objected to the Umayyads, they objected to the Abbasids, even though they had different perspectives on how um, to tolerate uh, bad rulers. They didn't uh, believe in just toppling the government. Um, okay, so that's all I'm going to say here. We see that uh, there's also the emergence of another theological school. We talked about the Mu'tazilites. We talked about different sects that emerged. And now let's look at the Ash'aris. So the early Muslim community of proto-Sunnis, proto means before this term was used in that way, that the, this community is a community that will later in time be perceived as Sunni, but who at this early phase still had certain ideas and beliefs that held them together. Um, I write about this. If you're interested, you can look at my book on Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. But um, the early Muslim community of proto-Sunnis were at odds as to how to confront the many theological disputes that had emerged in the first two Islamic centuries. Um, some people wanted to engage these debates, others wanted to completely isolate themselves. Uh, Al-Ash'ari was initially a Mu'tazilite and a student of his stepfather, Al-Jubba'i. And al jubai was one of the most important scholars of the Mu'tazilite school, and he was, in fact, one of its founders. So an Ash'ari was his stepson. Ash'ari leaves the Mu'tazilite school. This is a typo here. This should be Mu'tazilite school and forms his own school of theology. And um, texts on how this happened love to narrate the story. And this is something that all of you who have a little bit of um, more depth in your training of Islamic theology, you should be familiar with this al Ash'ari's paradox. And you find this idea of paradoxes um, appearing in different forms in different traditions. So this is al Ash'ari's paradox. Uh, al Ash'ari posed the following dilemma. Uh, to dispute the Mu'tazilite concept of islah, which states that God is bound or obliged to do what is in the best interest of individual humans. So al-Ash'ari asks al-Jubba'i, what do you say of a believer, an unbeliever, and a child? Jubba'i replied saying, the believer is in heaven, the unbeliever is in hell, and the child is in a place of safety. And Ash'ari asks again, but what if the child asks God, why did you not let him grow up that he might earn a bigger reward? And Jubba'i responded saying, God would say that he knew that he would be a sinner if he grew up. So God didn't allow the child to grow up. And Ash'ari replied, then wouldn't the unbeliever ask God why he did not kill him that he may not sin? So why didn't the... Uh, if God is bound to do what's in the best interests of humans, 
then why didn't he make sure that the sinner died before he became a sinner? So al jubai had no answer to this paradox. And so al ashari le left the Mu'tazilite madhab. So from al ashari we have uh, an entire school of theology that develops. We see this, uh, uh, the, the ashari school also has two phases. It has al mutaqaddimin and al mutaakhirin The classical ashari school starts with ashari himself, and then his student Al-Bayhaqi, Baqillani, Ibn Furaq, Isfaraini, Al-Baghdadi, and Al-Juwaini. So these are the uh, figures that really form the classical Ash'ari school of theology. We see that by Juwaini's time, that he shifts in his use of ta'wil. Before Al-Ash'ari used to say, we say that God has a hand, but we don't ask how, bila kayf. But over time, the Ash'aris began to see that not asking and not explaining these, um, these verses creates more dilemma to the faith of those who are asking the questions than answering them. And so al Juwaini capitulates or concedes to many of these uh, concerns by shifting uh, the openness to, of the school in taking on much more um, uh, methodologies based in reason that others would say are Mu'tazilite, but uh, the Ash'ari school itself adopts these ideas as necessary for the preservation and the capacity for people to believe in, in God. The post-classical Ash'ari school um, this is where Sunni philosophical uh, theology begins, the school of the muta'akhirin. And um, this begins with Al-Ghazali. So contrary to common misconceptions or misconceptions of the past, I believe this is really shifting among um, modern scholars today in the academy that Al-Ghazali closed the doors of reason. Al-Ghazali actually was the one who opened the doors of using reason and theology to uh, using reason and rational thought to um, restructure how uh, the Ashari school talked about theology. So after Al Ghazali, we see what we might say is a Sunnification of philosophy and a philosophication of Sunni theology. When Al Ghazali writes his uh, Tahafut al Falasifa, He's actually not saying that philosophy is incoherent. What he's saying is using the methodology and the framework of reasoning of philosophers themselves, there are certain key issues that don't add up. So he uses the very methodologies and the frameworks and the way in which philosophers debate and talk about things to debate with philosophers. So this was something that was really a dynamic shift for the Ash'ari school. After Al-Ghazali, um, those who follow his framework of thinking really adopt this uh, methodology of talking about God themselves. So we see some of the names of the muta'akhirin, the post-classical Ashari school are um, excuse me. Um, we see Al-Ghazali followed by Siraj al-Din al-Urmawi and Fakhr al-Din al-Razi. So the century from Al-Ghazali to al-Razi is really very important in that Fakhr al-Din al-Razi goes even further um, than Ghazali and really restructures um, Ash'ari theology based in a framework that addresses um, uh, many of the issues brought up in philosophy. So this framework that we saw earlier, let's see if I can go back here. So remember this framework, you'll see now Kalam theology becomes divided into these sections after Fakhreddin al-Razi. So ontology, epistemology, and um, we said it was eschatology. Um, Fakhreddin al-Razi, al-Isfahani, al-Iji, Baydawi, Taftazani, Jurjani, 
uh, Ibn Kamal and Tashke Prizade are among the luminaries of the post-classical Ashari school. At the same time, we see simultaneously there is a school known as the Maturidi school developing in Central Asia. And Samarkand is the capital of where uh, this theology is really developing. So Bukhara becomes the capital of the development of Hanafi fiqh, whereas Samarkand becomes the capital of the development of Hanafi theology. Um, So Abu Mansur al-Maturidi was a contemporary of Ash'ari and he follows the theological framework set by Abu Hanifa in his fiqh al-Akbar through the lineage of Hanafis who migrated eastward from Iraq. So some of the main points that uh, Ibn Kamal says that the Maturidis and Ash'ari schools differ on are first, uh, for Maturidis, God can be known through the intellect without revelation. For Ash'aris, one who has not received revelation is not accountable for belief in God. Number two, things can be a vice or a virtue in and of themselves, and God's obligations and prohibitions are so because of this. For Ash'aris, what is good and bad? This is a question of husn al uh, of acts are determined by God's decree. So is, is killing bad because God made it bad, or did God prohibit it because killing is bad in and of itself. So this is what they're debating. And this uh, question actually comes from ancient uh, philosophical questions where uh, Socrates asks, are, uh, are actions wrong because the gods deem it as wrong or, are, or do the gods deem it as wrong because uh, uh, they are in and of themselves wrong? So these are debates that take different forms as uh, uh, these are issues that have been debated for centuries there, maybe even millennia, and that Muslims take on the same um, issues that were being debated. Is um, fasting good because God made it so, or is it, um, fasting is probably not a good example because it's, a, um, it's an act of worship and the acts of worship are done as tahabudi because God uh, has, uh, determined that one does such and such as an act of worship. So let's think about moral acts like stealing. Is stealing bad because God made it bad or did God forbid stealing because it's bad in and of itself? So these were issues that were debated. And if things are bad in and of themselves, then can people uh, discover what's good and bad without revelation? Uh, other issues for Maturidis, women cannot be prophets. For Ash'aris, they can. For Maturidis, humans have free choice that is independent of God's choice, but still within the bounds of God's will. So they make these um, fine distinctions, the Maturidi schools. And this is closer to the Maratazilite view. For the Ash'aris, human, humans will and act through God's will. So there's this idea of kasp in the school of the mutaqaddimin in which um, humans acquire their actions by God who gives the actions uh, himself. Some of the leading Maturidi scholars, the founders of the Maturidi school are Al-Maturidi Rustukhfani, Abu Yusra Al-Pazdawi, Abu Mu'in Al-Nasafi, Ala al-Din Al-Samarqandi. Um, in the formative era, we see Al-Kishi, Najm al-Din, Umar al-Nasafi, Al-Usmandi, Al-Ushi, and Nur al-Din al-Sabuni. And then late Maturidi scholars, pre-Ottoman, we see Al-Khabazi, Samarqandi, uh, Muhammad ibn Ashraf al-Samarqandi, Al-Nasafi, and Al-Namishi. Uh, we see that during the late Ottoman period, during the late Ottoman era of Sunni theology, that uh, the Ashari and the Maturidi schools really coalesce. They come close to one another um, by the many theologians during the Ottoman era who write in a manner that you can't really tell are they Maturidi or Ashari. So scholars like Taftazani, and eg and Georgiani are Ashari school scholars whose works are studied by all Sunni theologians. We also see that there's an exchange between Sunnis and Shias under the Safavid and uh, Ottoman uh, schools of thought 
So Sunnis and Shias overlap on many issues related to philosophy and metaphysics at this time, because they're um, contrary to say what was happening in the Mamluk Madrasa system with its curriculum that emphasized the Nakliyat. Those in the Ottoman um, Madrasa system coming out of the curriculum that emphasized the Akliyat used rational reason to engage with Shias. So the Ottoman Sunnis and Safavid Shias had that bridge of uh, rational reason to be able to debate issues related to philosophy and metaphysics. So we see during this period, a lot of overlap between Ottoman and Safavid scholars, whereas they diverge on issues on prophecy and leadership. And again, we see the Ottoman scholars um, uh, as well as the pre-Ottoman scholars at EG, Taftazani, Georgiani, these scholars do not engage with Shiism using polemics, but they use rational debate. Uh, we also see that Nasir al-Din al-Tusi, who is a Shia, his famous text, Tajrid al-Aqa'id, becomes a source of discussion on theology among Sunnis and Shias. So Georgiani and Isfahani write commentaries and responses that become the main textbooks used in Sunni lands, while al Hilli writes a commentary that becomes used in the Shia Safavid Madrasa network. So we see a lot of sophistication in this period. Um, one thing I want to add here is the school of the Athari. As there's the Athari school, which is the people of Hadith. And these were individuals who really didn't want to engage in rational discussions, and they accepted outward scriptures and uh, statements and scriptures without thinking about it, without interpreting it, without trying to understand it. They use what they would say, bilake, without asking why. So God has a hand. It is not like a human hand, but it is a hand of God, which we do not understand and cannot comprehend. We accept the statement without further deconstruction or attempt to understand what is meant by the hand of God or throne of God. So this would be an example of their methodology. They're not going to um, engage it or think about it. It's just they accept it, bilakef. They object to ta'wil or metaphorical interpretation of these verses. Uh, as become the norm among mainstream Sunni. So ta'wil and metaphorical in interpretation of these verses about the hand of God, in fact, become mainstream among post-classical Sunni theologians, uh, but the ah Ahlul Hadith uh, object to this as well. Uh, this is a small group. They often follow the Hanbali school and it is not a mainstream position, even though we do see those who, are try who have tried to revive this theology in the modern era, particularly uh, it's also a peculiarity of American Islam that you see that um, this minority school is vocal and attempts to have dominance in the um, American Muslim community. And we could talk about this a little bit more uh, in the Q&A session. So a few words about 19th and 20th century theological reform and renewal movements. Uh, beginning in the 1800s, Muslim lands saw many new challenges in terms of new philosophies and ideological trends that had not been addressed in texts of classical Islamic theology. So um, the eclipse of Aristotelian-centered philosophy in Europe after Descartes saw a shift in the philosophical thinking that challenged Islamic philosophical theology that was still based in a framework of ancient philosophy. So we see that Europe leaves this Aristotelian framework and uh, it challenges Muslim thinkers. Many Muslim thinkers in the 19th and 20th century began to view many of the intricate theological debates as obscure and no longer relevant. So this idea of wujud, existence, and um, all of these things are have been really spent a, century, a millennium discussing it. For them, this is no longer relevant. There are more um, important topics to discuss at this point. Uh, is the is the idea that starts to come about in the 19th century. There were other scholars, other thinkers, who sought to simplify Islamic sciences in a way that unified the madhab, schools of law, thought, and theology, so that Muslim can, Muslims can face challenges from European colonialist endeavors as a unified Muslim force. So we see 
in the 19th and 20th century, there's really an aggressive um, attack from um, missionaries who are um, who uh, become rooted in the Muslim world, mm -hmm. as well as uh, alignment of missionaries with colonialists who have an agenda to occupy Muslim lands, and they build schools and uh, print newspapers, and there are all of these ideas that uh, Muslims find themselves bombarded with and not knowing how to respond to. So some thinkers said, we need to get rid of all the madahib and schools of law and thought and theology and just simplify everything so that we can focus on this uh, particular uh, issue. Some of the uh, issues that challenge the Muslim world in the 19th and 20th century, uh, theological reform. So some of the issues that challenged the Muslim world at this time as it was interacting with Europe were um, positivism. So positivism is the idea that knowledge is derived exclusively by experience, experimentation, and natural phenomena gained in, uh, influence in Muslim lands with many who went abroad to study, such as the young Turks who uh, return to Ottoman lands. So a lot of people, um, younger generations were going to Europe and then bringing these ideas back to the Muslim world and they became um, uh, the elite or the thinkers and uh, makers and shakers, so to speak, of, um, of thinking where they return to. Uh, Muslim thinkers began to formulate new ideas that sought to justify Muslim practices and social structures using the types of rational arguments based in sociological arguments as to why one form of life was beneficial. So why is uh, certain Muslim practices beneficial and they use these types of sociological arguments. Others tried to prove the Quran's authenticity using scientific miracles found in the Quran. And I put this in quotes here. Uh, scientific miracles. We also see Darwinism. So some Muslim explain Darwin's ideas of the survival of the fittest using religious frameworks. Uh, we also see Marxism. So this is another idea that um, Muslim, uh, the Muslim world starts to uh, interact with or is challenged by. Uh, this is the idea that religion is the opiate of the masses used by the rich to dominate the poor. Uh, finds those who try to respond to this by framing Islam in Mar Marxist terms, such as the Prophet Muhammad's mission being one in which he overthrew the wealthy Quraysh and made zakat, fixed charity, a religious requirement. So they reinterpret the seerah using Marxist models. Uh, deism is another idea that starts to um, uh, influence or have uh, impact within the Muslim world. And this is the idea that God is distant and is not involved in day-to-day -day life. So what we find is a whole lot of new literature that comes about in response to this. Uh, by the end of the Ottoman era and co uh, colonization of much of Muslim lands after World War I, there is also, um, there are lots of polemics coming from missionaries aligned with colonial powers in the Muslim world. And the three most prominent topics that you'll see in missionary polemics of the early 19th and 20th century is first, attacks on the character of the Prophet Muhammad, second, on the role of women in Islam, third, on the social structures uh, of Muslim lands. So these are three topics that you'll see missionary polemics really focus on when they are um, addressing the Muslim world. This results in creating a reactionary posture by many Muslim thinkers in the 19th and 20th century who feel a need to defend their faith, not only from outside attacks, but for many Muslims who are becoming more and more enamored by European styles, lifestyles, and ideas. So this, this is a time of real confusion in the Muslim world. And this is a time where a lot of young people are really enamored by everything that is European. And um, for Muslim thinkers of this time, they're really concerned on how to respond to this. How can they um, engage in ideas that will um, keep people inside of the faith? 
And so we see these topics that we discussed before become not really as important anymore. This is not as urgent as these issues that arise. So we find a new school of contemporary theology that develops. Um, these are some of the names and what they've written. You can um, look at this in closer detail later, but Harputi, Ismail Haq, Shahban Darzadeh, Philip Ali Ahmed, um, Arab Kirli Avni, Said Nursi, the Noor letters, you might've heard about that, Muhammad Abdo, who himself saw himself as coming from the, um, and was classically trained, and he saw himself as coming from within the um, tradition of uh, classical training, but he was responding in a way where he wanted to reform or respond, uh, revive Islamic thinking. Uh, Shibli Normani. And I thought I had Ahmed Dahlan. Did I miss that? Ahmed Dahlan should also be here. So Ahmed Dahlan is the founder of the Muhammadiyah. So I'm not sure why that's not here. But that is the end of my presentation. And I hope I did not confuse all of you, but um, I'm open to taking questions. And um, yeah, please ask me to clarify anything that was confusing. Wow, wow, Michelle, that was fantastic. I feel though um, we might need a flow chart to see where uh, how, how all these schools of thought and theology emerged and then maybe, you know, have it linked to a, to a map so we can see where in the world did it go. Um, but that That's was a great idea. That was, that was really, 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 um, that was just loaded with information. Um, if you guys have any questions, just feel free to either, you can raise your little hand, um, and, and, um, I'll call on you, or if you want to message me a question, you can do that as well. Um, I had just maybe a more of a, um, so a couple of clarifying questions. And the first one had to do with Akita. So you mentioned that Akita had really only refers to the belief in God and God's attributes. So does this also, this would not include stories within the Quran, stories of the prophets, biographies of the prophets. Does that considered part of Akita or is that considered just a, a line item in belief. Yeah. So uh, uh, Aqidah texts would have a section on Nubuwat, and then the section on prophecy will have each prophet, the basic, um, uh, what Muslims need to know about that prophet. Right. So it wouldn't be a lengthy compilation of all the stories of that prophet, but it would go through each prophet that's mentioned in the Quran one by one. And it would be in the section of prophecy. So a Aqidah text wouldn't really go into details of ontology. It might have a little bit of epistemology, but it's something that's much more digestible for an educated Muslim audience without uh, necessarily being a specialist in kalam or theology. Got it. Uh, um, does anybody have a question before I ask my, my second question? I have a question. Yeah, go for it, Rizli. Yeah, assalamu alaikum. That was uh, Ali. like, um, Ali that was uh, saying very deep, very informational, alhamdulillah. So I was um, going to ask, like I was discussing with my husband the other day and we were, um, like noticing, and uh, you could tell me um, if in your study, if you've seen that literalism and um, rationalism, does it seem to like uh, every few generation flip? Have you noticed something like that in your study? Like, um, huh. how do I put this? Like people become very literal, like to the, to the text. And then a few years or a few generations later, they want reason. And then reason gets nowhere at some point, and then they go back to literalism and so on. Have you seen mm. that happening? That's a really interesting question. Um, we saw it happen during the Inquisition, the Mehna, for example, in the Abbasid era, era 
We also see uh, where uh, there was this emph emphasis on rationalism and then there was a aggressive response to it by the Ahl al-Hadith. Um, we also see it in the modern era in which a lot of, um, in response to British colonialism, we see some um, movements that develop that become more um, uh, literalist in their interpretation. And I briefly touched on American Islam. I think that also is related to that in that um, for American Muslims, when they lack sufficient training in Islam, especially considering that Islam is still a young and new community in the United States, it's not, it does, many Muslims who don't have enough confidence in their faith and practice might just stick to what's um, literal or what's the strictest interpretation, thinking that that's being safe. That's the safe way to do it. Um, but historically, I think generally over 1500 years, um, it's been more geographic in that there were parts of the world that really focused on the aqliyat in their curriculum in the madrasa system. So the Selchuk madrasas, the Abbasid madrasas, the Timurid, Ilkhanid, Ottoman madrasas, the Safavid madrasas were all, uh, they focused on the aqliyat. And this comes from that Kufan tradition that spreads eastward and really um, takes root in that part of the world that is uh, historically the center of Islamic uh, learning. Um, and then you see in the Mamluk madrasa system like Egypt and Syria, uh, there is more of an emphasis on the naqliyat, which is the transmitted sciences. And so if you look at the alqaf of these madrasas and you see what the people who founded these madrasas um, put as conditions to be learned or studied at these schools, you see an emphasis on hadith transmission and um, things of that sort. So fiqh rather than usul al-fiqh as much, um, things of that nature. I don't know if I really answered your question. Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there was an ex-Muslim group coming up in uh, somewhere in India where I'm from. And that's the concern that we were discussing because they were looking for so much reason that they're finding it hard to keep up the belief. This is well, yeah, cool. Sorry. Thank you, Risley, for that question. Anybody else have a question? I have a feeling we may come back to you next week with the whole list of questions as we've had and we rewatch this. And, um, but I, I had one clarifying question and it was just about the path of Greek philosophy. Did you say that it went East before it went to Europe? Yes. So, um, Greek philosophy was studied in Alexandria in, um, what's Anatolia today. So Turkey, um, in Syria, um, in Iraq, in Baghdad, so the Beit al Hikmah, they were, there were Christian Arabs who were uh, reading and translating uh, Greek philosophy. There was also a center in Iran, Jundi Shapur, where uh, ancient philosophy, and that's why I like to call it ancient rather than Greek because it's so international, right? And when, when we, use these Eurocentric terms, we, tr we tend to then think in these frameworks that rational thought and thinking came out of Europe and stayed in Europe, whereas really it was centered in the East and only later did the Europeans discover it with uh, interaction with um, Muslims uh, during the Renaissance or before the Renaissance. Um, we also see that when Alexander the Great occupied lands going all the way into Central Asia, areas like Bactria, that he also brought the curriculum that was being taught by his teacher, Aristotle. So philosophy was discussed, debated all in those regions. And not only that, people were building on it and developing it further and shifting it and changing it. And I think it's Peter Adamson really who 
has a series of uh, a series of books called Philosophy Without Gaps, where he really tries to uh, rethink the Eurocentric narrative of how philosophy developed and shows that really philosophy was rooted um, in many other parts of the world. Fantastic. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, uh, Pakiza, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, Asalaamu As Alaikum. Uh, thank you for this. Um, I've really enjoyed this so far. I came in halfway through, so I would really love to be able to actually get all of the material. I know it's been recorded and it'll probably be on YouTube. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, great. So um, my question really is a general question. So I did philosophy at university. And, and like you said, it's very Eurocentric, right? That's, that's really what philosophy is taught to us as the Europeans with the great thinkers. I've never really had the opportunity to explore Muslim theology. And I'm really quite fascinated by it. I've tried in the past and there's been a lot of sort of gatekeeping around that within our community, unfortunately. So I would love to know some beginning points for us. I, I don't know if other people here are beginners as well, but I'm definitely very much a beginner in this space. So I would love to know um, perhaps books, articles, just places where I could start to explore this topic further, which is Allah. Oh, um, so someone asked Peter Adamson's book. So that would be a great place to start. Peter Adamson has a whole series, I believe it's now five or maybe six books. Um, it's called Philosophy Without Gaps. So if you look it up on Amazon, you'll see Peter Adamson, Philosophy Without Gaps. His third um, volume is on Islamic philosophy. And then, um, and even in his book, like he will say that there is still a lacuna in philosophy that emerges um, after Avicenna, it's not, it hasn't been studied sufficiently. Um, I'm trying to think where, oh yes, there's a great book that came out by Frank Griffel. Um, Frank Griffel, I, it's, I have it in my home. Um, what is it called? It's Post-Classical Philosophy in Islam, maybe. But if you look up Frank Griffel, as he spells his last name, G-R-I-F-F-E-L. He's a professor at Yale, and he's also recently published on, on this. It just came out this summer, and I'd been waiting for it to come out for a long time. And um, he also writes about Al-Ghazali's philosophical theology, Frank Griffel. So he is a good author to read on. Um, who else? Let's see what else do I have. Um, yeah, off the top of my head, those are really a few of the uh, the books I would recommend. Great, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Exactly. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, and just to answer your first question, um, we will have this. This is being recorded. It's currently on our website. You can go to MuslimSpace.org, kind of go through the tabs, go to Ramadan and the Ramadan live stream. It is there now, but we're actually going to upload it onto our YouTube channel within a couple of hours, inshallah, after we close out um, the Zoom, we will have it there. Um, any last, we can maybe take one more question. If anybody has a last question. I know there's so much that was covered. No, no one's raising their hand. Okay, all right, awesome. Wow, mashallah, this was, Absolutely incredible. Um, I was excited leading up to this and I now I just can't wait until next Sunday. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we inshallah will be back here next Sunday, 2 p.m. Central time uh, for part two. Uh, so be sure to be here, um, spread the word inshallah, watch the video again if you can. Um, I think that's all I have for now. Uh, Dr. Salem, thank you so much. Any closing words? Um, thank you so much for listening and being here. I'm really excited about the series. Next week, I'll be talking about God's attributes. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Shala, <laughs> we'll see you guys all um, next Sunday. But please, we have lots of things going on with Muslim Space, so feel free to pop in throughout the week. See you, to, see you all soon, Shala. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum.